Welcome, welcome to our program, The Awaited, which is dedicated to coming to know better the Imam of our time, alayhi as-salam. And my guest today is Sheikh Osama Al-Attar, and we're going to be looking at how we can connect to the Imam, alayhi salam in the 21st century. For those of us who are, well, all of us who are caught up in a very complex world, uh, and may feel sometimes that he's a bit distant, or some people don't particularly realize the relevance of the Imam to us in this day and age. So inshallah we're going to be looking at how we can improve our connection. as Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming here. Um, I, I've noticed in my, um, in my conversations with some followers of Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, that often um, they don't seem to realize, um, and at one time I didn't realize, um, that it's possible um, an integral part of, of the, our practice to have a living connection to the living Imam of our, of our time mm -hmm. Islam. so sometimes I've had people say um, I need help with this or that or this is my situation um, and from my own limited experience of, of, of connecting to the Imam I say to them so why don't you ask the Imam you know for help connect to the Imam they say oh you know should I do that? Yes. Um, oh, I didn't think of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've never done that. So, right. <laughs> um, it's quite interesting sometimes, you know, Sister Rebecca, it's, uh, we can ask the reverse question, is the Imam really in our time, in our life? Do we really need him in our life? Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's nice to see sometimes what, how do people respond to this? What if I tell someone that you don't need the Imam in your life. How would he? How would he respond or she respond? You know, and say like, no, 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 we need them in the. Yeah. And then if they say no, 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 which is I think ninety percent, if not more, uh, if not ninety-nine percent plus of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they will say no. Of course, we need him in our lives. We need to be connected to them. And they're like, okay, so looking at your life, does it show or appear that you have the Imam connected in your life? And that's when they start thinking for a second, saying, oh. Yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> yes. so I think it's sometimes, you know, good to look at the other side of the story. You know, you love the Imam so much. If you talk, most of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they'll say, yes, we need the Imam. Yeah. Like so I'm like, okay, so how do you have him in your life? Yeah. That, that's a good question to look at. Yeah, and, and also, is it, is, it, is it necessary? I mean, I think also what's, what's interesting is um, uh, how, again, many people on this, on, on this path um, don't completely understand, you know, the concept of wasila, or don't completely understand um, sort of asking um, our living Imam salam, for help. Mm -hmm. um, as one sister said, well, why do I need to? You know, our connection with, is with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. This is right. what a lot of people say. Right. Of course, it is. Our connection is with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So, so they don't see that. Well. They see him as some something superfluous almost. Mm. Well, why do I really need to speak to him or or, or connect him or think about him? Right. I've, I've got Allah. Isn't that what Islam teaches? Right, right. Yeah. See, it's interesting. Uh, when we, I think we need to kind of back a step, and when we look at the context of wilaya, okay. So the context of wilaya, okay. What is the definition of wilaya? And very briefly, wilaya, of course, means one is the recognition of the master. Okay. Second is the love for the master. Uh, sorry, the obedience for the master. And the third is the love for the master. Okay. Um, recognizing him, without recognizing the master, we would not be able to interact with him. And that's why, even when it comes, we have levels. We have wilaya to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wilaya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna ma waliyukum Allah wa rasuluhu wa alladheena amanu. And then we have the wilaya of the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And then we have the wilaya of the Imams, the Maqsumeen. And then we have a, a, a final level, a fourth level of wilaya, which is the wilaya of the Mu'mineen. Al-Mu'minuna wal-Mu'minat ba'dhum awliya u ba'dh. So, uh, what does each level of wilaya entail here? You know, and, and all three of the first three of them consist of the recognition, the obedience, and then the love. So, one could, for example, recognize his or her boss at work. Yeah. They know this is the boss. 
Two, they may obey the boss because they know if they don't, they could be basically given the pink slip, as they say in North America. Right. I don't know if you have this here. <laughs> no, um, we don't have that. But okay, so. That's uh, something new. Yes. Um, I'll basically let go of the position. Yeah. But they may not really like that boss. You know, in fact, they could hate him. Um, so, or her. Uh, so loving here is really important as well with Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam. So recognition, obedience, and love. And then if we take a look at this, that's why we find, for example, Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, when it comes about the recognition of Allah, he says, awwalu dini ma'rifatuh, the beginning of religion. This is in the first sermon of Nahaj al-Balagha. He says, the beginning of religion is to recognize him, to get to know him. Right. Okay. And then once you get to know him, then وَكَمَالُ مَعْرِفَتِهِ تَصْدِيقُ بِهُ Once you got to know him, now you have to believe in him. Okay? So that is the, the obedience part, you know. وَكَمَالُ تَصْدِيقُ بِهِ تَوْحِيدُهُ You know, and then the, the, the perfection and the perfection of, of, of uh, believing in him is the monotheism, to, re to recognize he is the one. And the, the greater the degree of understanding of Allah's oneness and Tawheed and monotheism then the greater the degree of submission yeah. you know and that's what Imam Ali alludes to in Dua al-Sabah for example when he says O oh Lord man da ya'rifu ma anta fala yakhafuk oh who is the one who does not recognize you and then does not fear you or recognizes you but does not fear you so now how do we recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is going back to your question that to some people who say I can get directly to Allah subhanahu yeah. wa ta'ala okay it's it, the recognition of Allah is only done through his prophet the prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can teach us about uh, can teach us about the, pro, the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there's no other way with our mediocre and very humble minds that can barely perceive the understanding of our own bodies. Yeah. How can we really perceive the understanding of the Creator? And that's what Imam Ali al -Islam refers to in Nahjul Balagha. When he is talking about Malakul Maut, the angel of death, he says, one wonders, how does he take the soul of the fetus in the womb of the mother? No. Some children, unfortunately, are born yeah. not live. Yeah. They die in the womb. He says, how does he take souls? Does he enter into the body of the, of the mother and then take the soul and then get out? Or does he actually stay with the fetus until the time comes and then he takes the soul and then leaves? Or does he command the soul to get out of the body of the fetus and the soul comes out and he grabs it and go? So he says, all these possibilities exist. He says, we don't understand how a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. So how is it possible for our very modest yeah. mind to understand the creator himself? Okay, so, so our minds are very limited, very humble. True, Allah does tell us that in order to you know, pray to me, worship me, Okay. But the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also ask says Ask me, I will answer you yeah, yeah. Uh, Ask me, exactly, thank you Ask me and I will respond to you But Allah also says Obey me and obey the messenger yeah. In other words, he has equated you know, Between his obedience and the messenger's obedience So they're equal Okay. And then Allah also says Ask those who know, yeah. or the people of the Quran. in kuntum when you don't know, if in kuntum la ta'lamun. Third, Allah subhanahu wa taala also says in the Quran, and seek the means to Him. Fourth, Allah says in the Quran, although He does say, iya kana abudu wa iya kana sta'in, and this is a lot of argument. People say, see, see, Allah says, we worship you and only you, and yeah. we seek help from you, and the problem is they. Continue to the next ayah. What does the next ayah say? That's one problem. A lot of people read the Quran sometimes with one eye. You know, you have to read them with yeah. both eyes. And it says, إِهْدِنَ الصَّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِ Guide us to the straight path. Okay. صَرَاطَ الَّذِينَ The path of those whom you have blessed. Which means there are those. Yeah. And the question, who are those? Yeah. yeah. Allah could have said, in an eloquent manner, for example, and I, you know, um, 
Allah could have said, guide us to the straight path, your straight path. Yeah. For example, sure. guide us to the straight path, and it's your sarat akal mustaqim. For example, or some other wording that Allah could have used. But He didn't say your straight path. He said the path of those whom I have blessed or you have blessed. Yeah. Now the question comes. So Allah is telling me. There are those whom if you follow their path, they will lead you to the path. And when you are doing this, you are worshipping me. You know, then you're seeking the help from me. Yeah. Who are those people? And according to a grand Sunni interpreter, non Shia interpreter by the name of Al Hakim Al Hasakani. He's got a book, he's Hanafi. He's got a book called Shawahid al Tanzil. In it, he states a hadith from Ibn Abbas where he says in this regarding to this ayah He quotes a hadith from Ibn Abbas where he says that The path oh. of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Ajma'in So here is the hadith from non-Shia sources saying that it is their path Second hadith from Sahih Muslim, which is the third most revered book in the, our brother's school of thought, the Nanshi'a school of thought. The first one is the Quran where all Muslims revere. The second one to them is Sahih Muslim. Yeah. The third one is Sahih, uh, sorry, the second one is Sahih al-Bukhari. Yeah. The third is Sahih Muslim. Yeah. In the Sahih al-Muslim, the Prophet says, I am leaving amongst you two things, Kitab Allah, the book of Allah, and my progeny, not my Sunnah, not Sunnati, mm. refer to Sahih Muslim. He says, Kitab Allah wa itrati ahla bayti, the progeny, my family. As long as you hold on to both of them, then you will never go astray. Okay. And Allah has told me that they will never separate until the day of judgment. That's another hadith. And the third hadith mentioned by Al Hakim and Naishaburi in his book Al Mustadrak al Sahihain. He says in a long story, I'll just go jump to the hadith directly, the Prophet where he says that Ali Ma'al Quran wal Quran Ma'a Ali. Ali is with Quran and Quran is with Ali. We all know Quran is infallible. Yeah. It's the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Prophet is saying Ali is with the Quran. He is both. And the Quran is with Ali. In other words, this is the definition of infallibility. Imam Ali is also infallible. You know, they will never go apart, they're together. So the concept, if you think about it, if we go deeper, the concept of Asma infallibility is not just in the school of Ahlul Bayt. And he says, Al-Hakim says, Hada hadith on Sahih. This is an authentic hadith. True. When we take a look at all this, okay, so to recognize Allah, we need to recognize the Prophet. In order for us to recognize the Prophet, وآله, we need to recognize Ahlul Bayt, alayhim as and that's why Allah says in another ayah in the Quran, Obey Allah, the Messenger, and those who have command over you. And who are those who have command over us? It is Ahlul Bayt, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. And that's why in the dua of Imam Al Zaman, alayhi salam, which called dua Zaman al Ghayba, it is found in Mafatih al Jinan. The dua states, Oh Allah, make me recognize you. For if I don't recognize you, I will not recognize your messenger or your prophet. Oh Allah, make me recognize your messenger. For if I don't recognize your messenger, I will not recognize my imam, the leader. And Oh Allah, make me recognize my imam. For if I don't recognize my imam, I would be misguided from my religion. So to those who pose this argument, we do not mean Ahlul Bayt. The argument is, is, is not a valid argument. That you can go directly to Allah, true. But how do I get directly to Allah? It is through Ahlul Bayt. People will say, well, sometimes if you take a look at the, had the du'as of Ahlul Bayt, they always turn to Allah. Yeah. It's like, for example, Dua Kumail. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salamu alayhi alayhi, he says, Ilahi, 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 Ya Rabbi, Ya Rabbi, and so on and so forth. Oh my Lord, oh my, my God. So he himself is saying, we say, okay, fine. But who is teaching us Dua Kumail? Yeah. Amir al Mu'mineen taught us Dua Kumail. Who taught us Sahifa al Sajjadiyya? Imam al Sajjad taught. Who taught us Dua Arafah? Imam Hussein and Imam al Sajjad have taught us Dua Arafah. 
So without them, we did, would not have this wealth of du'a yeah. and wealth of knowledge. We need them so that they could teach us. And these du'as are not just words. They're actually lessons and, and knowledge. And people have done PhDs on the du'as of certain of the ma'asumin alayhim as -salam. So let us not really brainwash or try to fool ourselves in saying that, you know what, we do not need the yeah. imam. We, without them, we would not recognize the Prophet. Without that, we would not recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's uh, a very good point. And I, I think sometimes, perhaps it's not that people say they don't need them, but they don't understand um, why they should turn to uh, the Imam of our time, alayhi salam. Um, but that's, that's a very good uh, explanation. That I mean, I, I sometimes also say to people that, they are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gifts to us. So mm -hmm. they are a gift. If someone is going to give you a gift, um, you know, that's going to help you with your life, <laughs> would you say, no thanks, mm -hmm. you know, I can manage. Mm -hmm. um, especially a gift that's from the divine, really. So, um, but also just, just thinking about our, our lives in the 21st century. Um, of course, we think a lot about what the role of the Imam salam, will be when he when he arrives? What is his role now? What is his role among mm. among us who, who are yes. in this situation now? Uh, in fact, interestingly, there is um, a, there are several letters that Imam has written to some people, and he's written several letters to a great scholar by the name of Sheikh Al Mufid. Yeah, those letters can be found in a book called Al Ihtijaj by Al Allam Al Tabrasi. In one of the letters that Imam has written to uh, Sheikh Al Mufid, he tells him, and we look after our Shia. Imam is looking after us. Yeah. His role is to protect us, to take care of us. Now, some people say, really? Well, look at what's happening yeah. to the Shia <laughs> all over the world these days. Yeah. Despite all this, you know, if you, some scholars have said no other community other than the Shia have been persecuted so severely like the Shia have been persecuted for the past 1400 years. Mm. Take any nation, any religion, any faith, none of them have been persecuted the way the Shia for the past 1400 years, from day one until this day and age. Yet, Look at the wealth of knowledge that they've left to the world yeah. and they still have to the world. Look at the Shia scholars, how much they're contributing to the wealth of knowledge to this world. For the past 1400 years, if, if there was a group that had been persecuted so much like the Shia have been, they, they should have nothing left, yeah. left from them anymore. Yeah. I mean, the times of the Abbasis, for example, and how they persecuted the Shia, they followed the children of the Imams and the Imams themselves. And, and, and they persecuted their followers and by mass killings, massacres, um, and so on and so forth, until this day and age. Yeah. Yet you find the Shia are always prevailing. Yeah. The message always prevails of Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. And you wonder, all this is happening by coincidence? It can't be. Imam alayhi salam, if it weren't for him looking after us, this message would have been long gone, long yeah. gone. It would have been long gone. But he does protect the Shia. He does look after them. He does pray for them. He does feel the pain when they suffer and they go through difficulty. If we keep this in our thought and our mind, and if we really remember this and believe in this, I mean that Allah tells us in the Quran about the Holy Prophet, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ In the last two verses of Surah At-Tawbah, or the second last verse of Surah At-Tawbah, Allah says, Allah has sent amongst you, I'm paraphrasing the ayah, a messenger who is really compassionate about you, who really cares about you, who really feels the pain that you guys suffer and go through. And Allah gives two of His attributes to His Messenger, Ra'ufun Rahim. Allah is Ra'uf, Allah is Rahim. But He gives these titles to the Messenger. You are Ra'uf, He's also Ra'ufun Rahim as well. Compassionate, merciful. 
So this tells us how great the Prophet was. Indeed, the Prophet used to feel when, whenever a mu'min was killed in a battle or dies, it's as if his own brother has just been lost, as if his own father was lost, as if his own his son is lost. So he really cared about the Muslims. He cared about the authors. It is said, Asma bint Umais, the wife of Ja'far, At-Tayyar, after he died, when Ja'far was killed, then she remarried Abu Bakr, and she was pregnant with her son Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. This was during the time when the Prophet was on his last Hajj, the last journey. So when they were in Masjid al-Shajara, what's known as Masjid al-Shajara, to do their ihram, you know, there from Medina, Asma went through her labor, she was about to deliver. The Prophet did not want to make Asma feel that she will be left behind and all the Muslims are going to yeah. go and continue their journey. And so the Muslims did not care about her. He did not want to even make her feel that much of lack of consideration. So he told all the Muslims, we'll wait until she delivers and then we'll continue our journey. And indeed, they waited until she delivered Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr. And then the Prophet said, okay, now that she's feeling better, we can continue the journey. So the Prophet had that much consideration to yeah. people. The same thing applies to Ahlul Bayt alayhim yes. salam and the Imam alayhi salam of our time. He has that much love and compassion and mercy to his people. If someone wants to know why, because we know that they are nafsu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. You know, according to the ayah of Mubahala, they're the same essence as the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. So, it's that kind of, we keep this in mind. Now imagine if I know my Imam alayhi salam, my Imam is watching me, he listens to me, he hears me. How much more comfortable I would be, that's what really adds serenity, tranquility to me and my life. And then it can really make me focus on the important things in life. And I always know that he's watching over me, yeah. he's looking after me. So this really brings the comfort and joy. And you can see a person psychologically, emotionally would be a lot more comfortable knowing this. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, we, we have to, uh, we ourselves have to initiate in a way that, that, that uh, connection. Absolutely, so, uh, yes. It's, uh, it, it, it comes from us to, sort of to, to turn to him and seek him out and, right. and speak to him. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yes. You've you got to start with, with yourself. When you approach him, he'll start approaching you. When you start making connection with him, he'll make a, a stronger connection with you. And, and we have to take these initiatives, correct? Thank you. You're watching The Awaited and we're examining how we can connect to the Imam of our time, alayhi salam, in the 21st century in this day and age. We're going to go to break. Inshallah, we'll see you afterwards. Welcome to our program, The Awaited, which is dedicated to coming to know better the Imam of our time, alayhi as-salam. And my guest today is Sheikh Osama Al-Attar, and we're going to be looking at how we can connect to the Imam, alayhi salam in the 21st century. For those of us who are, well, all of us who are caught up in a very complex world, uh, and may feel sometimes that he's a bit distant, or some people don't particularly realized sometimes I've had people say um, I need help with this or that or this is my situation um, and from my own limited experience of, of, of connecting to the Imam I say to them so why don't you ask the Imam you know for help connect to the Imam they say oh you know should I do that yes. um, oh I didn't think of that mm -hmm. oh I've never done that so right. <laughs> Um, it's quite interesting sometimes, you know, Sister Rebecca, it's, uh, we can ask the reverse question, is the Imam really in our time, in our life? Do we really need him in our life? Yeah. You know, and, and, and it's nice to see sometimes, what, how do people respond to this? The relevance of the Imam to us in this day and age. So inshallah we're going to be looking at how we can improve our connection. as Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Here. Thank, Thank you for here. coming here. Um, I, I've noticed in my... Um, in my conversations with some followers of Ahlul Bayt, that 
often um, they don't seem to realize, um, and at one time I didn't realize, um, that it's possible um, an integral part of, of the, our practice to have a living connection to the living Imam of our, of our time mm -hmm. in Islam. So, What if I tell someone that you don't need the Imam in your life? How would he, how would he respond or she respond, you know, and say like, no, 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 we need them in the... Yeah. And then if they say no, 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 which is I think 90%, if not more, uh, if not 99% plus of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, they would say, no, of course we need him in our lives, we need to be connected to them. And they're like, okay, so looking at your life, does it show or appear that you have the Imam connected in your life? And that's when they start thinking for a second and saying, oh, yeah, that's true. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. so I think it's sometimes, you know, good to look at the other side of the story. You know, you love the 